so um, yeah, so I guess we're still gonna record it and start. But are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Sherry Thompson, the editor of the Pennsylvania Administrator, and I just want to thank everybody uh, who joined us today, uh, the authors and the attendees, um, to join for joining us for the live webinar. Uh, Ask the author. And uh, without further delay, I'd like to introduce you to today's facilitator, Jonathan Ross. He is a board member and he's also a member of the magazine's editorial review board and he will facilitate today's webinar. John. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we appreciate you taking the time. Hope you find value uh, out of this experience. Thank you most of all to our authors, um, not just for submitting uh, something for our publication, which is really huge. You know, that, that entire publication every month is membership driven. So uh, having folks that, you know, take the extra time to write something and submit it, um, it, it's always great to see what's going on all over the state. So we appreciate you for doing that and also for taking the time today to kind of maybe expound a little bit more um, on, on your work. So uh, what we like to do in the beginning is uh, a quick round robin kind of introduction elevator speech. So I am going to um, go through and call on each one of the authors one at a time. Um, Ed Smith, we'll start with you. And uh, what I'm gonna ask, ask each author to do is to just take a few moments, introduce themselves and uh, do a quick summary uh, of their article and uh, what, what their work is all about. So um, Ed Smith, as soon as you're ready, the floor is yours. Well, I'm glad I got to go first. Um, first off, I'd like to say thank you to um, everyone for allowing uh, the opportunity to uh, express our opinions through the written form, so I do appreciate it. Uh, like uh, John said, my name is Ed Smith, proud principal here at West Vincent Elementary School. Um, a Blue Ribbon Award winner, I might, I might tell you. We just got that last week, so that's always good news. Um, so this is my eighth year in Owen J. Roberts School District, and uh, very happy to say that uh, the, one of the things that uh, sparked this was the word connected, connectivity and connectedness to um, our students. And so uh, everyone does something with either SEL or building relationships, and so we, we didn't take a unique approach, but something that's been uh, done before, and that's uh, creating uh, mentor groups. And so every single staff member in a building is connected with uh, eight to 10 students, and we keep them throughout their time at West Vincent. We're a K to six building. Um, currently this year, I, I graduated up to second grade, so I have uh, 10 second graders still. Uh, they did run me over last year as first graders. Um, but at the end of the day, it's about building relationships, maintaining relationships, and uh, give our students an opportunity to have a connection beyond their teacher or counselor. Um, so it's a unique setup for us. And each month we kind of concentrate on something coming up. Uh, next month is gratitude and talking about what gratitude means and how it, it, it can uh, be part of our daily lives. Um, so at the end of the day, um, I, I'm, I'm pleased with the, this is our third year doing it. Um, our, my counselor, Mrs. Sarah Weber, is instrumental in leading it, and uh, everyone has ownership in it, and everyone has ownership in every single, all 585 students that are in the building. Um, and as a result, we have been able to see a decrease in the number of visits to our nurses suite, uh, uh, absenteeism and has uh, decreased as well, students reporting bullying has decreased, um, so it's been uh, widely received throughout the community. Um, so that's my uh, elevator pitch, and uh, good luck to everybody else. Thank you. Perfect. Ed. Thank you very much. Um, next, we're going to go to the other side of the Commonwealth. We'll go out to Pine Ridgeland, um, and I believe Kristen Justice is with us, uh, along with. Oh yeah, you've got someone else there as well. Okay, so uh, I believe that's uh, your superintendent, Dr. Miller. And Kristen Justice, you want to take a few minutes and uh, introduce yourselves and tell us about uh, your article. Certainly so. I'm uh, Kristen Justice, the Assistant Superintendent for Elementary Education and Curriculum here in Pine Ridgeland School District. And as you mentioned, Dr. Brian Miller, our superintendent, is joining us here. Uh, we, again, responding to the connectedness prop, um, saw our story of resiliency at Hans Elementary School as something that would be um, a good story to highlight in terms of our community coming together. We had um, parents, staff um, working hand in hand with our facilities department, et cetera, when we were faced with the challenge of 
finding a discolored tile, which led to a need for mold remediation 16 hours before the opening of school um, in the 2018-2019 school year. So it essentially um, culminated with us constructing a school within a school um, at our Eden Hall Upper Elementary building, a 4-6 building. We relocated um, all of the classrooms, um, the materials that would be necessary for the students to learn and even put finishing touches on such as um, posters from the older kids with individual student names on it as well as name tags on the desks, recreated lockers, had pipe and drape um, sorts of classrooms set up in untraditional spaces um, and really were able to overcome that challenge and deliver on our mission which is to focus on learning for every student every day. So um, despite the challenge it actually brought the community closer together and it enhanced our connectedness and we believe that has a lot to do with the ethics and the transparency with which we addressed the situation and in how we reported the results um, and as we will get into the discussion points later it actually helped us um, continuously improve by looking at a uh, monitoring kind of schedule for our facilities for air quality water quality etc kind of led into some other work that we had ongoing in the district that's great thank you very much mm -hmm. um, we'll stay maybe out on the west part uh, Zeb Zeb Jan Jansente a fellow board member uh, with me on the PA Principals Association, um, who uh, published something in, in our spring issue. So Zeb, why don't you go ahead and tell everybody uh, what your article was all about. Sure, thank you, Jonathan. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, the article that I've uh, been involved with is really um, about what's going to be taking place with, uh, with teachers, the uh, teaching staff in a lot of districts, and the, 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 the shortage that we'll be faced with uh, in the near future. Uh, many of the folks who came in the wave uh, through hiring process through the Mello Bill um, is is going to hit in just a couple years. So there's going to be a, a large shortage of teachers, uh, and also uh, the the data and trends that we're looking at uh, talks about a 38 uh, percent fewer teachers going into the profession from just a small time frame of six years from 2000 to 2016. And then on top of that, a 58% uh, decline in, um, in teachers being certificated uh, into the profession. But more so, uh, the importance of having a balance of teachers in your school. New teachers bring that innovative piece. Uh, they bring uh, the new practices on board. They help to stimulate that school. Uh, and there's a, a lot of research that shows that, you know, whether um, you know, uh, a veteran teachers uh, choose or not, uh, there's, there's a phenomenon called, um, you know, they're going to be, become stagnant. So we need the new teachers and uh, the teachers partway through the profession to energize and keep those, keep that school, you know, in, on the cutting edge, but really provide the type of education that students will need when they approach the 21st century uh, experience. Um, once again, I'm on the board. I've been on the board since 1998. Um, I've been in the Principals Association as a member since 1991. And I'm probably one of the longest tenured uh, high school principals in the state, if not the longest. This is my 29th year as a, uh, as a high school principal. So um, that little bit of experience I bring to the table uh, helped to prompt me to write the concern about where are we going with public ed or e even cyber, any of the schools out there that are going to be faced with teacher shortages in the near future. Thank you. Nice job, Zeb. I'm, I'm not sure how you can have that many years and yet look younger than me, but uh, we'll have to figure that out sometime. <laughs> it's just uh, it's nine all, years, buddy. It's all in the camera work, John. Thank you. <laughs> all right, great. Thanks, Zeb. All right, uh, let's go to another uh, team, uh, Dr. Weilich and Mr. Orth, um, who are on the eastern side of the state here in Chester County. Um, and they're gonna take a moment to uh, describe for us uh, the article that you guys submitted for the spring issue, please. Hi everyone, uh, Travis Orth here with my um, uh, co-author partner, uh, Dr. Weilich, Dave Weilich, uh, formerly assistant principal at Lima Middle School with myself. We were uh, partner team here. Um, he now has since moved on to head principal of Radnor Middle School, so I'll let him introduce himself. Hello, everybody. So, my, so like Travis said, so my, my name is Dave Weidlick, and uh, you know, I was an assistant principal here at Lionville Middle School and really had the tremendous opportunity to work uh, alongside John and work alongside Travis. And um, 
you know, last year in the summer of 2018, we, you know, we, we sat down as an administrative team after talking with teachers and parents and students. And, you know, as reflective administrators, we recognize that our, that our building's passion uh, and our motivation really needed to be refocused on the development of the whole child. Uh, kind of going back to the concept that uh, in order to have Bloom, you have to have Maslow uh, all figured out. So um, the charge of our article last spring was to really highlight the varied activities and, and events that uh, the Lionville Middle School community, uh, we engaged in during the 2018-19 school year. Um, all of our activities were grounded in the importance of building and sustaining authentic relationships uh, with all of our students. And um, ultimately, uh, what we wanted to ensure was that every student who walks through our doors, uh, that they knew that they were valued, uh, that they are cared for, and they are truly heard on a daily basis. And most specifically, you know, that every child has a champion. And, um, you know, some of the things that we saw, you know, we're hoping, you know, we're connecting the activities through uh, to some things that we noticed. Uh, we had discipline decrease. Our student population uh, remained pretty status quo and our discipline numbers decreased uh, in terms of uh, feelings, the sense of belonging and talking with kids, you know, throughout the year, uh, that sense of belonging uh, in comparison to years past increase. And ultimately, the overall feel of the building, uh, warm, safe, supportive, uh, that was also very positive. And that just didn't come from kids. That came from uh, that came from teachers, that came from parents. And so um, I know that there's a big push right now, and not a big push, but it's, uh, there's a lot with social emotional learning. And, um, and, you know, as administrators, there's a lot that we can do. And we we're just happy to share what we were able to do last year. And uh, I since have left, but I know that these guys are, are doing a real bang up job continuing these, uh, these types of initiatives and, and even moving, uh, you know, forward uh, with more. So when you when you uh, sit down and take a look at the the article, what we did was we kind of broke down every piece of what we do in the building, and when we uh, when we looked at it, we we realized how much we actually do. Um, uh, and I'm sure all of you can say the same about your buildings as well. So if you sit down and kind of make a list of things that you do throughout the year that make uh, that makes connections with kids, and really not only just you as a, as an administrator connecting with kids, but really pushing that on to the teachers. Um, because, you know, in, in our setting, we, we, we get test scores, we perform, but we really want to get deeper and make connection with kids and make sure that they're comfortable in our setting. So uh, I charge you guys to all sit down and make a list of all the things that you do, because you, you, uh, we need to applaud you as well for, for all the great things you do in regards to making connection with, with, uh, with your students. All right, nice work, gentlemen. Um, just in the interest of full disclosure, yes, Dave and Travis uh, were my assistant principals last year. I abstained when their article was submitted, so the article got published uh, without my influence. I did uh, uh, step out of that, but it, they did make a great point, and that is when uh, you go through this process, and I think the other authors might agree, when you go through this process of writing about what you do, um, you know, I think far too often we hesitate to brag about the things that we do, and having submitted a, a couple of articles myself, the, the best part about it is really taking the time to look and say, hey, there are a lot of things that we're doing at our school. So that might be the best part to come out of that whole experience. Um, so thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we're gonna go to Tom Kramer next. Um, Tom, if you could just take a minute or two to tell us a little bit um, about your article, please. Sure, um, thank you for having us. Um, I wrote our article with our Director of Communications, Shannon Zimmerman. Um, she's phoned in uh, as well, so if you have any questions for her, you can ask her. But what we wanted to focus on uh, was in the positive school climate was how do we communicate with our families and our community members about what we're doing at school. Um, we work so hard uh, to create a positive environment at school and we're doing so many great things. Sometimes we don't market ourselves well enough so that the community members and family members know exactly what's happening in our buildings. A lot of people have perceptions about what school looks like because of when they came and what they did. Uh, but school is vastly different from when a lot of our kids' parents uh, attended school. Um, so what we focus on in our article was how we're getting that message out there. Um, we use a variety of platforms. Uh, social media is our big is our big thing. We're using Twitter and Instagram, Facebook, um, and we have daily email blasts. So we have a lot of things that we're that we're using. But the way we coordinate that information and what information goes where, based on the way we're targeting. Um, different demographic groups and, and who we want to see those things. We use different platforms. Um, we also try and focus on all of the positives. We try and get out the things that are happening with our PBIS system within the building uh, so that parents can have those conversations with their kids about what's happening and really communicate those things at home. 
And some of the other things we've tried to do is we've really tried to utilize some of those platforms that um, aren't being used right now by schools. So we're trying to use a lot of video options out there with YouTube uh, to, to get our message out there. Um, we've also started doing a monthly podcast in my building where it's a very short six to seven minutes, uh, just an update about, about what's happening for the month, important events. We try to interview students and teachers about things that are happening. But our goal is just, you know, we're working so hard to build that positive climate within the building. We want people to know these are the great things that our kids are doing, that our staff's doing, and we want that message out there so that they can hear it and see it. Thank you, Tom. Well done. Um, and nice work. I, I enjoyed uh, your article and I, I'm looking forward to taking some questions on that as well. By the way, I see that we have about 18 participants, folks that are listening in can see and hear us. Um, if you have questions, uh, you, you should write them. If you scroll across the bottom of your screen, you'll see there's a chat option um, and you can type your questions right into that chat feature and uh, we'll be sure to answer them as we go along. Okay. Um, next, we're going to go to uh, Mark and Jay. Um, if one of the two of you would uh, like to take a moment to uh, give us a quick intro and tell us a little bit about your article, please. Sure. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. My name is Mark Hogue. Uh, I am joining from Slipper Rock University. However, I used to be um, a former high, high school principal at Greenville High School in Mercer County on the western side of the state. So Jay, is, Jay Barris is also joining me. Our article was really focused on um, utilizing the SLO process as a vehicle to increase and, and support uh, school climate and school culture through a sense of collaboration between our faculty. In our school, it seems like we're usually hitting the subtraction button related to losing staff through attrition, our enrollment struggles, and, and very frankly, a few years ago, our academics were, were, were struggling as a result of just think a lot of people working hard, but in their own silos, in their own departments, et cetera. Um, so one of the things that we looked at is really trying to utilize the vehicle of the SLO as a conversation piece and a tool to allow uh, faculty members to work as peer supporters through an action research project, not just an assignment or an expectation that's done annually with the SLO, but really a critical look at our curriculum, at student achievement data, support subjects uh, through the humanities and different elective subjects to really try to again bolster and support all the work that we're trying to, to contribute and grow related to our tested subjects and I, Ed, I've got to tell you very directly congratulations on your National Blue Ribbon School Award uh, we were really excited that in 2017 we were named a National Blue Ribbon School That's something that again for a community that struggles that has um, some significant uh, barriers to success. It was something that, again, we could celebrate a lot. And again, the SLO process we looked at, again, previously as just one of the many things that we have to do as a staff, as a faculty, as a building, and really, again, trying to break, embrace a common vision of scholarly work around our staff and working as peer supporters was something that uh, really provoked good conversations about curriculum needs and best practices and instruction. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, appreciate it, Mark and Jay. Um, just real quick, uh, looking at the comments, uh, Susan, uh, one of the people who's joined us, we can see your comments. We can only see and hear the people that are panelists. So if you're viewing this just as a, not as one of the authors, um, again, you can make comments, but we cannot see or hear you. Uh, so please keep that in mind. All right, and then our last uh, set of authors that we have joining us, uh, Michael Snopkowski from uh, Avon Grove. Um, Mike, I hope, I hope I said your last name correctly. Uh, why don't you take a moment, if you could, please, to uh, tell us ab about your work. Sure. So I'm here today with Scott DeShong, who is our high school building principal. Um, we spoke about this process last year as our district started to take on more of a social-emotional learning uh, tack. Um, but I think consistent with what we heard when we started to think about how we wanted to build relationships and things that had been happening. Uh, we could go back several years and identify a variety of things that, that were happening at Avon Grove High School to build relationships, not just between students and each other, but students and faculty, and then faculty in our community. So the focus of our, our article really was on four specific components that we looked at um, in trying to build time and intentionality around those connections. And then the results that we've seen from that have been increases in students um, working with each other, 
working with our teachers, increased academics, and I think overall just an improvement in the culture at Avon Grove High School. So there are really four things we looked at in doing that. One, um, several years ago, we started a process to um, change and update our, our bell schedule. Uh, a lot of high school principals in the room, the bell schedule is like the holy grail of the high school. Uh, so that was a, a significant process that took a lot of work with a lot of different stakeholders. We've really come, come up with an outcome that we're um, proud of and also is very effective and efficient at the same time. Uh, we started um, professional learning communities with our teachers three years ago around the whole premise that our, our purpose as a high school was to create the best conditions for learning. Uh, we're in our, as I mentioned, our third, uh, our third year of that process and have really uh, begun, begun to make the, the four questions of a PLC to be common language in the high school. Uh, somewhat related to the social emotional learning focus was the um, starting of a, a freshman mentoring program. We have junior and senior students who have uh, gone through a pretty extensive interview and training process and they work with our entire freshman class. Uh, as the freshman year progresses, they work with smaller groups of students and then even get to the point where uh, we identify students who need some additional uh, mentoring and, um, and, and they're provided by our, our junior and senior mentors. We're in our second year with that program. It's really been a, a great way for our kids to, to give back to other kids and, and kind of uh, shrink the size of our school. We're not a super huge high school, but we have almost 1,800 students. And then finally, in terms of... Uh, you know, investing in the community, we're um, almost one fourth of our of our students are Latino, and we're going to make sure that we are, are providing voice to all segments of our population. So, as a high school administrative team, uh, we, we reached out to our entire uh, school community and created Padres Latinos, a program for the parents of our Latino students. Uh, we're in our second year with that program as well. It's been, been a really great way to connect um, our school and the community in uh, in a different direction than we've done in the past. Great, and while I have you guys, since you were the last ones to go, I'm gonna ask you a follow-up question first. Um, can you just take a moment, because one of the things I was very interested in in reading your article uh, is how you talked about creating a schedule to facilitate your project-based environment. Mm -hmm. um, can you just take a moment to, to talk about the implications of that for kids? What does that look like? Is that across all curricular areas? Just uh, tell us a little bit about that. Sure, so the, the schedule that we used to have was a very traditional high school schedule that was an eight period day, 30 minute lunch, 42-ish minutes per period. Um, what you can see in the article is we went to a six day cycle that's a drop two, so we were able to build in really 54-ish minutes on a normal day, one through four, and then a block period for every one of our, our courses to meet during uh, the course of each week or each cycle, I should say. Um, what that did is it gave us time to begin to actually get into the deeper learning that project-based learning is intended to, to work on with students. Um, many of our, our hands-on courses immediately jump to it because instead of getting going, having about 20 minutes to do work and then starting to pack up, I mean, they were able to get into 35, 40 minutes on a regular day and up to 85 or 90 minutes on the extended days. And what we ended up seeing was that one of the, the departments that had the greatest amount of growth in student interest and enrollment was our applied engineering. Uh, we started with three teachers in that area. We now have five teachers in that area, and we have almost double the requests for courses that we can actually still manage with five teachers teaching six sections each per semester. Um, and, and the work that has been able to happen, there's a few things concurrent with that. We also have got, uh, now transitioned to being a one-to-one -one environment in our high school, and we're doing all of our, our learning through Schoology. It's providing our students and our teachers different avenues through which they can uh, connect and interact with each other. And it also has provided um, really for our families and our district an opportunity to see a more authentic representation of learning in many of our classes. Um, we're not there yet that every class and, and every subject area has project-based learning and the types of things that we would want to see. Um, but we've certainly made an incredible amount of progress. And, and most of it began with the opportunities that were availed um, through the change to the new schedule. That's great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to get to a question for Zeb in just one minute, but I kind of feel like, um, Ed, if I could ask you a similar follow-up just about scheduling. Uh, you know, I got to think, I'm not a, I've never been an elementary principal, but setting up a, some kind of schedule system to allow for these mentor groups, was, was that a big hurdle to overcome? Uh, remember, elementary is a place to be, right? I don't know about the high school <laughs> guys, but elementary is a place to be. Um, 
the scheduling I have built into the schedule class meetings. Um, you know, it's kind of a, the tenants of Alveus, uh, responsive classroom, and uh, just probably good best practice. So uh, within the schedule uh, each week, it's built in there. And so the mentor groups, uh, what we decided to do is I can uh, equate the time by scheduling that 30 minutes um, throughout the, that for that one time in a month. And then that could offset the, uh, the uh, class meeting for that week. So it wasn't a big leap. It was a little bit of getting everybody on the same page and making sure that we go between morning and afternoon. So we're not hitting the same core, core areas. Um, and we, the only one group that uh, we, we kind of struggle a little bit with is, and that's our kindergartners since they're only here half day. Um, so we really do the program first through six. Um, but the scheduling piece was a combination of everybody kind of pitching in and uh, looking at the schedule and what makes sense. So it wasn't a big leap. That's great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, okay, Zeb, we have a question here for you. I'm not sure if you can see it um, over in the chat. But the question is, do you anticipate the state intervening with undergraduate teacher prep program incentives? Um, I know Duquesne University offers 50% off tuition for those pursuing education, other programs you're familiar with um, when it comes to undergrad. And that question is from Dan. Sure. Hi, Dan. I appreciate the question. I, I think you're going to see more and more uh, universities uh, take that leap uh, where they are going to basically uh, find a way to discount prices uh, to encourage students to get into the education field. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's such a, a decline, uh, almost nearly 40% decline in just the last six years of folks getting into the education profession, going in as an undergrad with aspirations to go on to be a teacher, I, you know, and ultimately uh, many of them go into administration. But uh, the Mellow Bill was, uh, was put in place around 1993. And those folks are getting close within five, six years of the wave of, of departure. Uh, and as you recall, and many of you may or may not recall, the large influx of, of teachers. So uh, it's really incumbent upon uh, Pennsylvania and really a lot of the um, private schools are taking the, the initial steps, such as in the article, to provide those half cost discounts to uh, entice students into the profession. Um, but also, I, I think that there are other th factors that, you know, we really haven't talked about, and that perhaps might be uh, the retirement system. As you know, uh, Pennsylvania was probably one of the best retirement systems for educators over the last, you know, 40, 50 years. And now that's taken a turn um, with, with a change of retirement as of new people entering the uh, field as of July 1 of this year. And, and, and that retirement system has been greatly impacted. I don't even want to discuss the, the, uh, the effects of that. But um, it, it, once again, Duquesne's kind of on the forefront. I have not seen, I'm an adjunct professor for, um, for Point Park University, and they also have a very strong education field. They're still, um, they still are getting a lot of folks and a lot of online uh, schoolings are taking place, uh, undergrads as well as graduate programs. A lot's going online. California University of Pennsylvania, another big leader in the area with online um, options for students. Uh, but once again, I think people are a little bit asleep. And that's why I, I wrote the article about the fact that within the next five to six years, we're going to have a massive exit of, of retirees. And we need to address that. We need to start planning it right now. Uh, in order to address it. Thank you. That's great, Zeb. Thank you. Um, going back a little bit to scheduling, if I could ask the folks from Pine Richland um, to, to jump back in here a moment. Uh, thinking about the notion of taking an entire school and relocating that school to a new place. And you talked a little bit about in, in your article about the, you know, the physical layout, but how about the scheduling part of that and the transportation part where you know, what, what kinds of hurdles, what kinds of problems did you have to overcome and show your resiliency when it came to trying to schedule two buildings at the same time in one location and get transportation for all those kids? Sure. Uh, so again, I'm Brian Miller, superintendent of Pine Richland. Uh, Greta Kazilla is the principal of the building, and that was her first year as principal. So 
she had not yet opened her building even one time and we had this situation happen. So um, as always at Pine Richland, we have a real team approach to things. And so as we evaluated the mold, we, we did some initial remediation to see if we could just um, safely return students to school. But while that was going on, we, we started a whole bunch of contingency planning. And, and that included everything from facilities to transportation to food service uh, to our teachers and paraprofessionals, uh, really everything. And uh, all of that work over a weekend was done so that if we needed to make the decision to move, we had all the pieces happening in parallel. So um, little things like taking an auditorium space and we were able to make six classrooms in that space using eight foot high pipe and drape. We moved all of the furniture from different places within the building and, and cleaned that. We bought carpet for the floor so the teachers could use that. We had interactive display boards set up so our technology was there. We rebuilt a main office so that we could use a, a separate entrance within our four, five, six building. And that included rerouting all the phone systems. So uh, if you were to walk through the side door of Eden Hall Upper Elementary, you would have never realized that you were even in that building. It would have felt like you were in Hans Elementary. And so that was 350 kids and about 40 staff members. And uh, you know the excitement that comes with the first day of school, we wanted to create that. And we did that and that included every aspect. So we had speech and language, OT, PT, uh, every single service we would provide, uh, health services and nursing we were able to provide that uh, with very minimal impact to the students at Eaton Hall. So there are about 1,100 students there, and we were able to make slight modifications, particularly to band, orchestra, uh, phys ed, in order to make that happen. So it was, um, there are so many details related to that. It's incredible, but we, we had many hands at work and because we had done the hard work of planning in advance, when we actually executed that, I can't even tell you, it's one of the proudest moments I've had in 24 years in education to see how uh, that went together. You know, we had a, a meeting for parents at our high school where we could describe and show pictures. We had an open house so they could walk in and see it. And, and I would actually say, for, from my view and from the parent feedback, they were so blown away by the effort on behalf of the district and all of the people working together that it, it probably strengthened our community. Uh, there was really no question of, you know, they were not upset with the results of the testing. They appreciated that we were keeping kids in a safe environment. And when they saw the hard work and all of the attention to detail, uh, it really strengthened our culture and it gave Greta Kazilla uh, a remarkable first year principal story uh, that she can tell for the rest of her life. So really uh, um, having the right people in the room, including all those different specialties is really what made it happen. We're, we're fortunate that our Eden Hall School is within a couple of miles of Hans, And so the routing for buses was really a minor detail. Food service was probably a little more of a challenge even than transportation. But when we had kids receiving interventions in the first couple weeks of school, in a diff first couple days of school, excuse me, in a different location, really remarkable. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, I, it's like every school administrator's nightmare, I'm sure, that's, that's up there, but among other things. And as, uh, as, as you said, uh, to have that happen and for, it to, for you to come out on the other end stronger, it really uh, speaks a lot to to your district and your community. I'm sure they appreciated that. Um, Dave, Dave and Travis, um, if I could go to you, you guys next um, and just ask you if you could uh, to take a moment um, explaining to folks what it is that uh, takes place at Lionville Middle School when it comes to uh, building those relationships and rapport, maybe not hit on everything, but some of the outside the norm things, because we all do things, you know, teachers do things within their classrooms to try and build that bond but there's a few things that kind of take place at, at Lionville that um, are outside of the typical that maybe the folks who are, who are joining us today might, uh, might be interested in. Sure. 
Sure. So one one of the one of the big things that we pride ourselves on is um, greeting the kids each day. Um, uh, it's it's uh, a great way to just say hello, spark up an informal conversation with the kids. So we're out there at 7 a.m. with that first bus drop off, first student drop off. Um, so all three administrators, both the uh, system principal, uh, system principals, and uh, our head principal. Um, out there greeting the kids again just uh those informal conversations connecting with kids um so we we pride ourselves uh it's a it's a good solid four, 40 minutes of the morning um and it's also indirectly a good way for uh the administrative team to catch up and uh kind of set up uh, our day if we have anything pressing we can have a, a quick conversation that way as well uh but most importantly it's to to greet the kids uh, for preparing drop off and bus drop off and uh, again just have those quick uh, conversations and, and um, get a get a face to a name so uh, so one of the first one of the big things that we did last year and I know that John and Travis and, um, and Janice Lear who is the assistant principal this year they continued with was uh, first day activities so nothing academic the first day I mean nothing traditional in terms of academics the first day uh, a lot of team building activities uh, and a lot of activities that are designed to make sure the kids know that every single one of them have value and every single one of them have purpose. And, um, and, and one of the ways that we did this, and it may seem, you know, uh, kind of simplistic is so, uh, last year we were working with close to about 1050, about 1050 kids. And this year I know that they're a little higher, but every single student left their handprint, their physical handprint in, in on our building. And the whole purpose behind that is, you know, for they, for them to understand that no matter who they are, no matter, you know, where they're coming from, no matter how they are academically, athletically, within the arts or anything like that, that they are leaving their mark here within the building. And, and what, like, I, like I said, while that may seem simple, it's, it's pretty, pretty powerful. And that's something that those, you know, the kids, uh, they pass by every single day. And uh, it's just something that, uh, that we felt, uh, you know, as an administrative team and teachers in, in terms of feedback and, and talking with the kids really meant a lot to them. Um, Something else that we that uh, we kind of delved very deeply into last year is kids need to be part of the equation in terms of learning, and they just can't be uh, just sitting back and just receiving it. They should have an active voice. So uh, one of the big things that our professional development push was was integrating student feedback. Um, you know, as administrators, we're giving teachers feedback. As administrators, we're getting feedback. Um, you know, from from our superiors, and uh, you know, kids are getting feedback. Um, but the actual people who are who are there taking in the learning, oftentimes their voices may not be uh, asked for. So uh, one of the things that we did is is we developed uh, some uh, some PD sessions, where as as a collaborative group we developed ways where student, where teachers can uh, uh, ask for student feedback three minutes or less. And I want to say it was about 25, 25 or thirty different ways, and you know ranging from uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one meetings with kids from whole group meetings to different types of, like, of, uh, of, uh, of electronic or um, digital feedback. And uh, we just wanted to make sure that kids know that their voice was heard and uh, that they do have an active part in their education. So, uh, One last thing that's uh, a pretty cool activity that um, actually went on before I got here. This is my second year in the building. Uh, is a, uh, a get to know you or I know you dot activity um, where uh, we print off all the student photos um, uh, of the entire student body and hang them up uh, in the library. Um, and we give the staff uh, dots, um, little uh, stickers. Um, and we ask the staff to go around to the pictures um, and any connection or any, any conversation or any fact or, or any type of connection they have with that kid or that child or student for, for that matter, um, to put a, a dot um, on their picture or next to their picture. Um, so this gives us a good indicator of, obviously your outgoing kids are gonna have tons of dots because they're, they're advocates for themselves and they, they reach out, they make connections naturally and that, that's easy uh, for us um, and we all get that. But, I think um, the the big uh, the big takeaway from this is um, the the kids that fall through the cracks, the kids that don't really um, speak up in class. They kind of do do what they need to do throughout the day. They get by. Um, they're not really on the counselor's radar. They're really not on your radar. Um, 
uh, it, it really pulls out those kids that um, are right in the middle, and it really highlights um, making connections with every single kid in the building. Um, so that's a, a pretty cool activity that we do. Um, it's, it's nice to do it twice a year in, in the fall and then again in the spring um, uh, throughout the, the year with your staff. Good. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, before I go, I was going to go to uh, Mark and Jay. Just one moment, Mark and Jay, if I can put you on hold there. Um, Lisa, one of, another one of our authors, uh, Lisa Schoenleber. Lisa, hopefully I said your name correctly. Um, Lisa just joined in, and uh, Lisa, if you're there, I wanted to give you a moment to introduce yourself and uh, tell the folks that are, are watching, um, you know, 60, 90 second quick conversation about uh, what your article was about. If you could tell everybody, please. Lisa. Positive connections for incoming freshmen and their families uh, for the class of 2022, which is the class that I picked up as ninth graders, and I'll carry them through to 12th grade. Um, we kind of did that through two main uh, ways, freshman orientation, and then also um, through um, a Trojan ticket, like a kind of a mini PBIS program. There's my 30 seconds. Yeah, that was quick. That was really <laughs> quick. <laughs> All right, we'll come back to you, though, just so you can get your feet okay. wet with your first question. We'll come back to you, though, with a follow-up. Again, folks that are watching this, uh, you can ask questions. If you use the chat feature that's at the bottom of your screen, uh, you can submit questions. But I did want to um, go to Mark and Jay next. You know, <clears throat> when I read uh, your article, gentlemen, and, and your uh, briefing that you sent me, uh, SLO and school culture, they're, they're not necessarily things that I would put side by side with one another. So uh, my question for you is, you know, how did you get to that point? How did you, uh, what made you decide to marry your SLO with school culture? Was it out of necessity? Was it a directive? And then maybe a follow-up, um, you know, how did that go over with the teachers? Did, did they respond well to that? Yeah, so for, for me, I mean, it's uh, very much uh, uh, not out of necessity, but just very natural in that we were focusing on trying to improve our overall school climate and culture. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we have a lot of new teachers that were coming in um, and we had an extra time with them per the contract that, that, you know, we have extra 10 days, basically some on the front end, some on the back end of that school year. Um, so we had this unique opportunity to take it a step further um, and through, you know, discussions with, with Dr. Hogue, you know, I'd found that, you know, similar things were occurring at, at Greenville School District as well. Um, so it was really a, a, you know, a beautiful partnership through um, working together prior and then also having similar experiences that led to, um, you know, kind of this article uh, collaboratively being developed. And, um, you know, we're actually uh, going to take it a step further as well. Um, this coming uh, October, lead 19, we'll be presenting on on, on this topic as well. Um, you know, I'll certainly allow uh, Mark to contribute and, and chime in here, but um, I think it was more, um, you know, at least for, you know, the middle school at the time uh, at PA Cyber, it was more natural just to, to have this kind of be hand in hand with the SLO process, um, collaboration amongst teachers, especially given, um, you know, we have sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade teachers at the middle school, it makes it a little bit easier. Um, certainly uh, when most of our teachers are teaching one subject area as well, so. Sure, John, thank you very much, and Jay, certainly to, to build off of what you shared. You know, high school teachers, middle school teachers, elementary school teachers, we're competitive, and I've got to tell you something. When you look at your school results and they stink, um, that provokes a pretty strong emotion, and I think at least at the, at the earlier stages of this project, as we date back and look at our work, um, there was a lot of, a lot of folks in, in my particular building that were working very hard and didn't feel like they were necessarily seeing those gains and those rewards when it came time for state testing and, and what ultimately at the time uh, comprised the school performance profile. So very directly, um, some of the work products that we observed at the, at the high school related to the SLOs, i got to tell you, they were pet projects. They certainly had a pre-test and a post-test, and the form was filled out, again, like I said, maybe in my elevator speech, 
but there really wasn't this sense of focus on some core goals curricularly and within the, the core subject areas that tied us together. So to look at to look at a necessary expectation um, in the SLO process and to say we are going to yoke ourselves and band together and focus on the same things collectively within our own content areas and disciplines and grade levels in a strategic way, instead of just kind of doing our own thing, our own silo, it, it was something that, again, really fostered a sense of collegiality. Folks were talking about what they were doing in class. And forgive me, maybe that should have been something that, that was more apparent um, prior to this initiative. And I know that it's not necessarily groundbreaking, but it was something where we realized a very definitive level of success in something as simple as, like you said, John, the SLO. And that's a, <clears throat> that's a great point, um, I, I think, Mark. And one of the things I think we too often as educators do is we belittle ourselves. We think of these things, these ideas that we come up with, and we don't think that there's anything new or unique or special about them. And to take something that, again, as you say, admittedly, an SLO is kind of a simple, everyone does it, and to kind of turn it on its ear like that, I think that was kind of the point I was trying to make is, it's not, you know, you're not going through the motions, I guess. And, and I guess that's kind of why um, you got the outcome that you did, you would say. Yeah. Thanks, John. Um, absolutely. So, um, Tom, uh, if I could bring you back in. And uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask you um, just about, you know, your, your focus on communication and uh, all the different platforms you mentioned, all the different platforms that you use um, in your school and in order to communicate. Um, I guess kind of a two-part question. One, I think one of the hesitation, even in 2019, you know, I remember when Twitter first started to get popular and uh, all of the forms of social media. And I know a lot of educators, uh, teachers, and leaders were really hesitant about putting themselves out there. Um, so uh, because of the, the negative reaction that you get on social media, people are worried about Facebook comments. People are worried that something you say or produce is going to get you know, misinterpreted or misused in some way. So talk, if you can, for a moment about overcoming that. And then I also wanted to ask you about your communication survey, because I know a lot of school districts um, do surveys on a lot of different things, school climate and safety and um, new information management systems and so forth. But an actual communication survey, maybe tell us a little bit about what, what that entails. Yeah, so uh, when it comes to negatives, you do every once in a while you get something on there, but but as a district, we leave anything up there. We don't want it to seem like that we're editing out comments and that we're only showing the positives and we're not taking all feedback. Um, so we do um, anything that may pop up that may be incorrect. We always have the opportunity then to re respond to those comments so that we can put out there to correct any incorrect information that's out there or any negatives that, that are not accurate. Um, so we do get a little bit, you'd be surprised. It doesn't happen as often. And most of everything that you get in terms of comments. Now I'm, I'm at an elementary school, uh, we're a K to six building. So a lot of the comments that we get is parents commenting and sharing with, with family members, um, about things that they see, but it's very, very limited. The amount of negatives that you get in terms of comments underneath, uh, social media posts. Um, we do have, in terms of a survey, we do an annual survey. Um, we ask, uh, parents, you know, what, channels work best for you? What do they use? It gives us, like I mentioned earlier, uh, an idea of, of who uses what platforms when we're trying to target things. We know Instagram is more along a lot of our students, um, especially at the high school level, where Facebook is really along the lines of our parent population. So we do a lot of information there. Um, we use that then to tell a story. Uh, we also target external people in our survey. Uh, so we get an idea of what the community is using. Because again, again, that's a population of people, of stakeholders that we don't necessarily get our message to because they don't have a student who's in school. They're not, they're not hearing that everything that happens during the day. So we want to know what are people using outside of our walls, outside of our families, so that we can get information out to them as well. Um, and that way, and that's some of what we're trying to do with the video platform and, and the audio platform is trying to reach out to um, different stakeholders that wouldn't normally see what we're doing here. That's great. Thank you for, uh, thank you for saying that, Tom. You know, there's a, I can't remember who the speaker is, but I've heard several times that the saying, if you don't tell your story, someone else will. And I think that's, uh, you know, really strong to, to think about if, if you're in a school or in a district um, that isn't controlling your message 
in this form, uh, someone else is going to be controlling that message. So yeah. it's always good to have a, a platform, multiple platforms like that to kind of get the word out um, to your kids and to your community. So I appreciate the fact that you guys are doing that there, Tom. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask Lisa one more question. And then I'm going to ask everyone in the group, I'm going to call on you one at a time. So I'll, I'll tell you what I'm going to call on the group about first. Um, just uh, next steps, um, what, what your plans are. You know, we're coming up to five o'clock here and that's the end of our webinar. So I would just ask you if there's uh, any next steps that you're going to take or maybe our folks at Pine Richland who I'm sure don't want to have next steps with another mold problem. Uh, maybe just talk about, uh, you know, what you took from this, uh, what, what you learned as a leader. Um, something along the lines of just kind of wrap up um, and, and discuss what your next steps are, okay? But Lisa, I did want to ask you, you know, the, the, the message overall to the kids, you know, one of the things that I was concerned about with PBIS at the middle school was that the kids might be a little bit too old for it, the whole ticket reward thing. Um, so just talk a little bit how that went over with kids at the high school and, and how uh, whether or not they were, I assume, they were enthusiastic about um, having this kind of program, maybe because they had it at the elementary school as well, but um, how, how did that go over with the kids at the high school? Lisa, unmute your microphone. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Okay. <laughs> I think many share your um, kind of idea that, hey, it's high school, like kids are not going to be motivated to do this, right? Um, surprisingly, the first marking period when we were giving away a lot of little um, random awards, rewards we did it really frequently like sometimes even two and three a week um and, and it was starting to catch on but not really until we had the big rewards at the end of each marking period where we were giving away chromebooks and those beats and all those other playstations that those kids want um then it really caught on because the kids were really motivated to be respectful and be um to class on time to earn those tickets so um Overall, I think you know the discipline chart showed that it was it was successful um, because the discipline was down, um, especially the disrespect and the late to class. So um, I think it worked really well. And ironically enough, at the end of last year, our school is on a TSI plan now, and part of that is developing um, an MTSS like analyzing all that, getting that together, and developing a PBIS. So we're going to do it school-wide, ironically enough. So I'm kind of looking forward to being a part of that movement there, too. So I always say, listen, I'm old, and I'll work for M&M, so kids will do it, too. Thank you. That's great, Lisa. Okay, so we have about, I think, in my count, eight authors, maybe, eight different folks joining us here. And we got about eight minutes left in the webinar. So if I could give each one of you 60 seconds as I said, some kind of closing comment, next steps, one major point that you want to make sure um, any of our viewers get. Uh, Zeb, I'm going to start with you. Um, just, uh, you know, anything you want to follow up with or any other points you want to make about anything that was said during our webinar today. Go ahead, Zeb. Sure. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, just the last thing that I would, uh, would say about uh, teacher shortage concern, but really the importance, I want to focus again on the importance of having new teachers in your school system. It's very, very important. A lot, of, a lot of districts across the Commonwealth are focusing in on balancing the budget at, at, uh, at the student-teacher ratio expense. So we need advocacy uh, that, that our educators are going into the profession and that they are uh, they're gonna be equipped to uh, leading our students in the future. It's our future, nothing more important than than having teachers on board and obviously being able to educate the youth of America. Thank you. Great, thanks, Zeb, great point. Um, Ed, Ed Smith, uh, any next steps or follow-up or any final comments you'd like to make? Uh, first off, I'd like to thank you, John, and the association for putting this on. Um, I've been fascinated listening to everybody's story. Uh, the thing that I take from it and our next step and a big uh, takeaway is relationships. We, we all know that they're key to success, so uh, maintaining and forming those relationships with all of our stakeholders, especially the students, um, can create our own mini stories and success. And so for us here at West Vincent, uh, it's to maintain our momentum with, with the mentor program and communicating the why. Why is it important? Why are relationships important? And to kind of nurture that uh, with, with each of our uh, stakeholders, like I said. Uh, so once again, I appreciate it. And uh, 
look forward to many more of these. So thank you for everybody and your insights. Thank you, Ed. And again, congratulations on your, uh, on your blue ribbon. That's a, that's a great accomplishment. So uh, good for you. Um, let's see, um, Michael and Scott uh, out in Avangrove, uh, any, anything you'd like to say to wrap up as far as your next steps or plans for the future? Sure. So our next steps are really to continue deepening the practices and processes. Um, what we found is that as the relationships have been built, uh, the work has been strengthened um, and allowing our teachers to continue with the time to work with each other, our students to work with each other, and then across various groups. Um, we're finding that more and more momentum and ownership is being taken by the individual groups. And um, it's, it's really our responsibilities as administrators to make sure that we provide the conditions for the people to continue to get together and to encourage that, that behavior um, because they're really the ones who are doing the heaviest lifting right now. Go crickets. So, and, and one other thing, you had mentioned uh, the, the, the concept of if someone doesn't tell our story, we'll, or if we don't tell our story somewhere else. I think that's Joe Sanfilippo. That's right. Yeah, that was his go yeah. crickets message. Go absolutely. crickets. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, the, the, head, the names are the first things to go when you, when you get to my age. So uh, let's see. Uh, Dave and Travis, any, uh, any last comments you want to make or things about next steps, comments you want to make? Sure. I think um, one of the big things that, um, you know, I tell myself every day is to, to uh, continue to uh, push that narrative of, relationships first, um, get to know the kids. Uh, that first month or two, I know I sit down and, and um, you know, a conversation with the administrative team here. Uh, if there's no instruction going on and you just use that time for the relationship building, uh, the rest of your year, the uh, re rest of the, the students here is gonna be that much more successful. Um, if you lose them that first week or two, um, it, you're, you're fighting an uphill battle the rest of the year, rest of those, uh, the next two years. Um, so I, I really think that's the, that's the, the foundation, the core of what, um, what we need to focus on. And I know that's what my main goal is each and every day when I walk into the building. Um, you know, no matter what, if, if I'm walking down the hallway and I see a kid, talk to him, say hi, make that connection. Um, I hate it when I see a, a, a teacher walk by, a, a student doesn't happen often, but, um, it, it does happen and there's no, there's no interaction there. So I think just, uh, grounding myself every single morning before I get started of, uh, that, that's my main focus for, for the day and everything branches off from, from there. So it, it, like in terms of next steps for me, so, uh, so this past year I just transitioned from, uh, from an assistant principal here at Lionel Middle School where we really delved into this whole concept of relationship building through. Uh, through school-based activities, and I uh, became the principal of Radnor Middle School in Radnor Township, and uh, so I came to that building with the same focus. You know, I had that the momentum started here, and I was very passionate and excited to continue a lot of activities that that we uh, that we did here, and started to implement them uh, with some tweaking, of course, uh, at Radnor Middle School. So my next steps is just to uh, go into the building and do whatever I can to build relationships with kids and staff, and uh, just remember that you know why we're there every single day, and that's going to be kids. So. Great, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, let's go back to Pine Richland, uh, Kristen and uh, Brian. Um, like I said, I, I'm not sure you would want. I'm sure you wouldn't want to go through that again. So I don't think you would have next steps. But um, any any departing message that you have for the folks that are watching right now about what you went through? Certainly. So while we hope not to go through it again, we are actively doing preventative testing to make sure that we're out ahead of anything that could, because what we don't want to repeat is that timeline if it were to occur. Um, and it's a part of life, but we want to make sure that we have healthy, safe schools. We are changing to a model here where we're cleaning for health, not appearance, and really making sure that we're out ahead of anything that could occur. But really, the communications were the most vital component of this and making sure that while it's a difficult message to share with families, not only conducting the testing and letting them know what's happening, but physically posting the test results that came directly from the third party vendor on our website so that there is no mystery around what has occurred. And that's both. Um, the tests that were conducted when we initially discovered something as well as the post test once we've um, finished remediation again helps really build the trust so we would encourage others to, to do that as well thanks for the opportunity mm -hmm. we appreciate thank this. you yeah and i can only imagine brian what that phone call was like that you had to make to your school board president when uh when you got that information that you were going to have to uh to make these adjustments the day before school started you know what we are very blessed here and um People would not believe it when I tell you how much support we have. So I spent next to zero minutes 
with the board. It was all about how do we support the kids. It's pretty awesome when that happens. It is awesome. That's great to hear. Uh, thank you and good luck. Um, let's go next to uh, Tom in Hempfield. Um, any next steps, Tom, that, uh, that you want to share with everybody or any parting message? Sure. I, I mean, everything for us in terms of next steps, it really revolves around our comprehensive plan. Um, our, our third goal area is community engagement. It's a lot of what we're trying to do with all of this messaging going out. Um, we're going to continue to try and expand our reach. We're going to look at more live video things for parents that can't get to things during the day. So PTO meetings, events, even sporting events, things that families might not be able to get to because of other commitments that they have going on. Um, so we're, we're going to try and expand to get a lot of that in. Um, and I'm also just going to plug, if you're at the PSBA Leadership Conference in October in Hershey, we're running a session there um, that'll go more in depth in all this. So if you'd like to attend, I'll put that plug out there too. That's good. Good move. Always put a plug in for when you're doing presentations. Good, good move. Um, okay, let's go Mark and Jay. Um, either one of you or both of you uh, want to share your next steps? Yeah, I'll be really quick. Uh, we're looking forward, as Jay said, to attending Lead 19 and presenting. Uh, one of the things that I'll be happy to get any feedback on and we want to do a better job with is really putting, putting the good work of our teachers out there in terms of uh, sharing the results of students, or I'm sorry, of student achievement through the SLO process and really trying to empower whether it's young teachers as Zeb's talked about or teachers in other districts to maybe lessen the learning curve a little bit and provoke, promote again good conversations around powerful learning and, and really being focused on results. So John, you did a great job. Thanks so much for hosting and emceeing and uh, wish you all just a great, a great rest of your week. I don't know if Jay was going to jump in or not. Um, yeah, thank you, John. Go ahead, Jay. Uh, real quick, one of the things we're looking forward to in, 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 and uh, at our school in extending um, this learning and this uh, recognition process is we're, we're going to be implementing the best practices of teaching and learning for our teachers and really recognizing those that are going above and beyond. Um, so taking it to that next level now, um, not only, you know, listening to the presentation and, and you know, giving that, you know, feedback to the teachers through the process, but then also, you know, formally recognizing some of our best teachers as well. Um, and, and just to follow up uh, what Mark said, thank you very much, John, for putting this on. And, and all, as always, you do a fantastic job for the association. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna give CNN a run for their money. I'm seeing with all the different, you know, when you turn on, they've got all these different panelists all the way around, trying to make sure we get everybody spare time. And Lisa, last but not least, um, anything, Lisa, you'd like to add uh, that you can get a chance to say or anything about your next steps, if you would? I'd just like to say that, you know, the success of our program um, in building those relationships is, and that positive first impression was definitely a collaborative effort. And it's collaboration because we had awesome teachers who were dedicated to making that positive impression from the get-go with students. Um, and with the counselors and then involving the community. So it was like a whole effort uh, to bring in those outside sources and then just communicating that over and over repeatedly. So, you know, definitely hope to continue that. I did write another grant, haven't heard if I got it yet or not, but hopefully I will continue that work. That's great, Lisa, and good luck with that. Um, so that's it, everybody. Again, I want to thank all of our authors for joining us today. First and foremost, thank you for taking the time to write something. Uh, for the PA Administrator Magazine, and thank you for taking the time to, to be a part of this. I hope you found it uh, meaningful. I know I did. I took a whole lot of notes uh, and got to get a whole lot more out of everybody's article hearing them talk about it. Uh, always preach your passion, folks. Always, you know, as I said earlier, when those things that you're doing that you don't think are, are a, big, a big deal, they are a big deal. There, there's so many things that we're able to learn from one another, and I think uh, those of us that are on the front lines, all of us here, that are on the front lines, you know, we know what it's like living this uh, on a daily basis. And if nothing else, it's great to hear that, you know, we're not the only ones that are experiencing some of these problems and, and trying to find ways to overcome these obstacles. So thank you for everybody uh, for participating, for joining us, and especially our authors. And uh, with that, um, I'll also be presenting at the uh, leadership conference uh, next month. If you're looking, if you're, if you're joining us at State College, um, but anyone else, um, you know, always, Thank you for your membership in our association, and I look forward to you to seeing you uh, after our fall edition, uh, which some of you already received. I'm sure we'll be doing one of these after that edition as well. So thanks so much, everybody. Thanks for taking the time, and have a great night. Thank you, Jonathan. Appreciate thanks, it. John. Thank you, all you folks did a great job. Thanks.